Well, I want to welcome people to uh, uh, Northeastern University School of Law. Uh, we're delighted to be uh, having this event to uh, uh, look at uh, casino gambling. Uh, we're having it uh, the uh, week before uh, the vote in Massachusetts, uh, the first time there's ever been a referendum on repealing a, a, a gambling uh, uh, scheme that had been passed by the Massachusetts legislature uh, three years ago. Uh, we don't know how it will come out other than the fact that the gambling industry, not surprisingly, has poured millions of dollars uh, into a campaign to defeat it. Uh, the public health community, uh, unfortunately, does not have you know, uh, anything like that to bring to the table. So, uh, 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 but the, uh, other than the truth, and the, uh, the truth uh, in this case is that uh, we here in Massachusetts, people in other states, uh, may not have gambling and may be uh, in an even better position than we are. They may be able to just keep it from coming in rather than trying to uh, stop it uh, uh, after it's uh, gotten a running start, uh, as it has here. Um, and, uh, uh, but, it, but it's still not really in place here. Um, so they may be in an even better uh, place. Other states obviously you know, do have gambling. There's going to be you know, efforts to expand it. There may be uh, public health moves to restrict it. So the, the question that we have today, which is, you know, is this, what's the problem? I mean, why do uh, the, why does the public health community have a problem with uh, casinos? Why isn't it simply uh, a matter of uh, individual choice? Uh, we'll discuss today uh, some of the answers to this that we're talking about uh, an addictive product. It's not addictive for most people who use it. Most people, the, in terms of counts, of the number of people who go to a casino, uh, most people uh, go to a casino and uh, bet some money, go for a weekend, go for an evening, afternoon, bet some money, and leave. But most of the revenue that comes, much or most of the revenue, depending, comes from addicted gamblers. The business plan for casinos is not based on the occasional gambler. The business plan for casinos is based on the addicted gambler, and these people are normally people who live within commuting distance of the casino. They can come there after work, before work, uh, on a day off, uh, just hop in the car, go a few miles. They're there, and they can blow through their paycheck, blow through their savings accounts, blow through uh, uh, savings accounts set up for their kids' education, and so forth. Is this a good thing to do? Is this an appropriate thing to do? Of course not. But it's addictive behavior. It's addictive behavior which the gambling industry relies on. It's their business plan. So uh, this is like any other toxic agent. You know, where is it cigarettes? Is it Ebola? Uh, this is a toxic agent that threatens our communities that's utterly unnecessary. You know, it's not endemic. It's not there. It's not there in the soil. Um, you know, it's there by deliberate legislative choice, and it can be gotten rid of by deliberate uh, legislative choice. And that's what we're going to be discussing here. Uh, my name is Dick Daynard. I am a uh, professor of law uh, here at uh, Northeastern, uh, and uh, Northeastern University School of Law is also host to the Public Health Advocacy Institute. Uh, which I'm president of, and uh, you will also hear today from uh, Mark Gottlieb, uh, who is the executive 
uh, director, and from Lizzie Friedman, who's uh, a senior uh, attorney. Uh, and they've both been studying and working on uh, this issue. But first, uh, I'm delighted to introduce David Aronstein, who is the director of the Boston Alliance for Community Health, who will uh, help fill in the public health perspective on uh, casinos. David. Thank you very much. Uh, so the Boston Alliance for Community Health is a, an alliance of neighborhood coalitions made up of citizens and service providers, hospitals, health centers, other community-based organizations. And our steering committee decided that we would uh, advocate for voting yes on question, question three, uh, uh, which will, in fact, um, uh, repeal the casino uh, law here in Massachusetts. This often gets framed as an economic issue, uh, and there are economic uh, economic uh, consequences of casino gambling, but they're not always the positive things that the proponents claim. Uh, we were happy to sponsor this uh, with the Public Health Advocacy Institute because this is a public health issue. Uh, we are focused on uh, issues of health equity, where everybody has an equal chance to live a healthy life. And uh, as you'll hear, people who live near casinos, uh, their chance for living that healthy life is diminished. Um, and we believe that uh, the public health mantra these days of we need to make the healthy choice the easy choice applies here in reverse because the unhealthy choice becomes the easy choice when there are casinos in your town and in your neighborhood. So we're pleased to sponsor this, and uh, even though we have uh, financial um, opposition in millions of dollars, uh, we think that over time people will recognize that casino gambling is addictive, it's destructive, it can destroy communities, and we're pleased to sponsor this. Thank you. And I'm Mark Godley, the uh, Executive Director of the uh, Public Health Advocacy Institute. And here at the Institute, we have for many, many years um, worked on um, understanding, studying, and opposing um, the tobacco industry and its products. And as we <coughs> turned our attention to the casino industry, we, we noticed many parallels. And uh, it seems that uh, Massachusetts is... Uh, in a situation now uh, where they can do something um, about uh, a predatory industry um, where they know what the consequences are going to be, which was not the case uh, with the tobacco industry, which had uh, long been established and uh, um, for since the, really the cigarette industry since the beginning of the 20th century, and we didn't know what the impact was going to be in Massachusetts. But in 1992, Massachusetts voters passed a ballot initiative, question one, to raise cigarette taxes and to uh, fund tobacco prevention efforts. And since then, the Commonwealth has been a leader in the effort to stop the cycle of addiction and ruined lives caused by the tobacco industry products. And following the passage of that ballot initiative, the Department of Public Health launched a powerful um, tobacco prevention mass media campaign and we were one of the first states to sue the uh, cigarette companies to change their predatory behaviors. In hundreds of towns, and eventually the whole state went smoke-free in workplaces and even bars. Uh, we were one of the earlier adopters of that. So our change in attitude toward the tobacco industry came after it became clear that the companies knew that their products caused addiction and that they deliberately engineered them for the very purpose of addicting new young customers and maintaining their existing customers. Um, this business model became unacceptable to us in Massachusetts, and uh, we became a national leader in the efforts to uh, reduce the harm caused by tobacco industry products. But in 2011, the legislature here rolled out the welcome wagon for another predatory industry uh, that profits from addicting its customers and destroying lives. 
And with the passage of the Expanded Gaming Act of 2011, Massachusetts was poised to join this growing list of states inviting the casino industry to do here what it does best, which is to bring in acres of computer-based gambling machines featuring state-of-the-art addiction engineering to harvest new Massachusetts customers and, in effect, liquidate their lives and often those of their families. Um, as more and more states accept casinos, the harm that they cause becomes more localized. No longer do problem gamblers have to travel to, to Vegas or to Atlantic City, or in this case even to Connecticut or Rhode Island, the machines that have come to dominate their thoughts would be right here in Massachusetts. And uh, people would, have, who have, would never have considered traveling to another state to gamble might give it a try when it's just a short drive or a bus ride away. And today's machines are not like those uh, one-armed bandits of, uh, of yore. Um, now every sensory aspect of the user's experience is designed to hold that customer in place and to maximize the industry, what the industry calls its uh, time on device to meticulously build a powerful and destructive addiction and slowly um, uh, collect the assets of the user. So next week, we'll learn whether we have come to our senses and decided to turn away the tobacco industry, uh, like Predator in the casino companies. Um, and then this is why it's so important to get out and vote yes on question three this Tuesday. And to show you evidence that, um, that demonstrates the similarities uh, between the casino and the tobacco industries, I have the pleasure of, uh, of introducing this morning um, an accomplished researcher, author, and senior staff attorney for the Public Health Institute who has done quite a bit of research in this area, um, Lizzie Friedman. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, um, David, and thank you, Dick, for laying the groundwork for the presentation that I'm going to give. I'm Lizzie Friedman. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Public Health Advocacy Institute here at Northeastern University School of Law in Boston. And um, I am going to be talking to you today about the, uh, the similarity between the tobacco industry and the gambling industry, both the similarity of their products and also their business tactics. So first we're going to do just a very quick primer on the negative public health effects of legalized gambling and compare that to uh, the, the, the harms of uh, tobacco. Um, we're going to be focusing um, uh, pretty much exclusively on the harms caused by electronic gambling machines, which are also sometimes known as video slots or video poker. And those are um, the great majority these days of the kind of gambling that happens uh, at casinos. We're going to talk uh, briefly also about the purposefully addictive nature of both uh, cigarettes and uh, video uh, gambling machines. And then we're going to look at three business tactics that uh, both industries have used to preserve their business interests and to grow their profits. The first is um, the corruption of, of scientific research and scholarship, um, which both the tobacco uh, industry and the gambling industry have grown quite adept at, at influencing. Then we're going to talk about how both industries use the creation of a whole uh, new vocabulary to frame the issues in such a way that public opinion uh, will, will be on their side and also to stave off regulation. And finally, both industries use personal responsibility rhetoric in uh, a way that shifts responsibility away from them and to the consumer. So um, most people know now that the tobacco industry's products are deadly, the most deadly um, of, of products and the contributor to the highest uh, number of preventable deaths. Um, to, smoking kills over 400,000 people per year. And over time, uh, tobacco products are responsible for the deaths of almost half its customers. That in itself, is shocking and would never be tolerated for any other legalized product. However, it goes further than that. The, uh, through the exposure to secondhand smoke, there is a much wider range of harm that is caused uh, when, you have, uh, when you have cigarettes 
uh, being smoked and very often the people around the smoker can be injured and um, even, even die from smoking related illnesses themselves. The tobacco industry has a long history of uh, targeting the particularly vulnerable members of society such as youth, minorities, mentally ill people, veterans, and uh, they consider them low-hanging fruit in terms of marketing to them um, and, and keeping them captive as customers. The gambling industry has created a terribly adverse public health uh, uh, environment as well, um, but has done a good job so far of trying to minimize it as a psychological disorder that affects really only the addictive gambler. So the DSM-5, which stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Diagnoses, uh, has recognized uh, gambling disorder as a psychological condition and has noted that these individuals uh, utilize medical services at a great, greater rate um, and end up costing society more as a result. Um, the problem and, and uh, pathological gamblers also suffer from not only physical uh, morbidities uh, such as um, heart uh, disease and obesity and, and things like that, but they also suffer from hidden, hidden maladies such as anxiety, depression, substance abuse, stress-related illnesses. And at the outer edge of their suffering is sometimes uh, results in suicide. Pathological gamblers and problem gamblers have a higher rate of suicide. Like secondhand smoke, gambling addiction causes a ripple effect to the people around the, around the gambler. And um, it affects their families, their employers, their neighbors, their communities, and society at, as a whole um, because addictive gambling, uh, what comes with it is crime, domestic violence, divorce, financial instability, and yes, sometimes suicide. Like the tobacco industry, the gambling industry targets society's most vulnerable members, the poor, minorities, and the elderly. And I want to say specifically about the elderly, um, how devastating it is that they are being targeted um, some casinos have facilities to keep elderly people, to attract them there and keep them there. They, some of them have on-site pharmacies, they have motorized chairs for them, they have a doctor on call, anything an elderly person would need um, to be in one place for a prolonged period of time is provided to them uh, by the casinos. So. The next thing that's really important to recognize is that both the tobacco industry and the gambling industry create their products to be purposefully addicted. It was only when society really understood that in the late 90s, uh, the litigation uh, that took place against the tobacco industry, when internal documents started coming out that showed that the tobacco industry purposely made their products addictive, that the tide of public opinion really began to turn. Cigarettes are highly, highly engineered products, and um, they are addictive through the manipulation of nicotine and additives. Uh, video slot machines, or as they're known, electronic gambling machines, not only use the design of the machines to addict customers, but also create the casinos create environments to encourage people to stay as long as possible and to, uh, uh, as my colleague mentioned, and to maintain a, as long a time on device as possible because they know that um, if they can keep the customer in thrall long enough, the customer will lose all his or her money. Both cigarettes and electronic gambling machines are thought to be as addictive as hard drugs and harder to quit. And both products' addictive nature reduce or eliminate the user's ability to freely choose whether they want to continue using um, 
the, the whole idea of moral agency or uh, personal responsibility just doesn't figure into it for someone who's addicted. The tobacco industry in, in the year 2006 was found to be guilty of violating the civil racketeering laws of the United States and found to be a fraudulent racketeer at that. The, there were a lot of internal documents that came out as a result of the litigation, and this is one of the reasons why litigation is such an important component of public health uh, um, action, because you find out what's really going on with these companies, and when you shine the light on it, you get support from the society as a whole. And it's, it, the tobacco industry has tried to pretend like it only realized in the late 90s that tobacco was addictive, dangerous to your health, and could kill you. Um, but I want to point out a quote from a tobacco industry lawyer from 1963 in an internal document which stated, moreover, nicotine is addictive. We are then in the business of selling nicotine an addictive drug. So that's, that's a quote from 1963. That's, the, that's one year before the release of the landmark Surgeon General's report in 1964, which um, for the first time officially linked smoking and disease. Likewise, casino video slots are also addicted by design. They're highly engineered, sophisticated. The algorithms and the mathematical formulae and the, uh, the people who work on, on um, uh, creating these machines are at such a level that it's almost, it's almost hard to comprehend what exactly they do. Um, and their purpose is to keep to create a game that will keep people, uh, keep gamblers satisfied enough to stay um, and to continue to play until they have no more money left. Um, and just like a cigarette, which uses additives and a certain dose of nicotine to go straight to your brain to give you that hit, um, which, is, which is sort of akin to freebasing cocaine, these video slot machines do a similar thing. They use intermittent rewards and payouts that tap into the gambler's cognitive and psychological functions. So again, the rush is going straight to their brain. And this bypasses the, the whole question of whether, they're, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to cash another, uh, another few, uh, few hundred dollars in for chips. The, um, another thing that the casinos slot machines do to addict their customers is they make it very easy for you to play extremely fast. You can have as little as three seconds between each round of, um, of play. Um, and so there's not a lot of time for uh, personal responsibility or even rationality to happen <coughs> in premeditation when Another, another game, another hit um, uh, is three seconds away. Another thing they do is they make it possible to, for the gambler not just to um, wager on one game, but at multiple games um, in the same session. Particularly with the video poker games, you might have uh, five hands going at the same time. You might have 10, 25. Um, and, and there's there's very little uh, there's very little cognitive reason or rationality that happens when you're playing that many hands that fast. It's about the rush. It's about getting to the next round. It's about staying in the game. About not losing your money before you're satisfied. Much less about actually winning. And as my colleagues mentioned, the casinos rely on pathological and problem gamblers for the bulk of their profits. Um, some studies have estimated between 35 to 55 percent of slot machine revenues are the product of pathological addictive gambling. So just um, to sum up the drawing of the comparison, um, I want to read to you a quote from a 2007 study that, um, that, that captures it very well. It said, both the tobacco and electronic gaming 
machine industries supply control impairing products that, used as intended, will inevitably cause some users to suffer profoundly. They will suffer because the products such used as intended will cause them to use the product in harmful quantities. The electronic gambling machine industry unambiguously depends on customers' loss of this magnitude. Without them, revenues would be more than half. So just like the tobacco industry uh, must addict its customers to get, it to, to get them to continue to use what they know to be a harmful product, so does the gambling industry rely on addiction to generate most of its profits. So now we're going to be talking about three specific business tactics that the tobacco industry used initially in which the gambling industry has, um, has mirrored and, um, and borrowed from the to big tobacco playbook. The first one is the use of corrupt science to create and maintain an open controversy. In the early 50s, several studies came out linking smoking and disease, and the tobacco industry got very worried about uh, what society would do if they thought that their products were deadly, and so they consulted a public relations firm, and what they were told to do was to take out an ad in several hundred newspapers around the country, around the U.S., and what they called the ad was a frank statement to cigarette smokers. And in the ad, they said that, above all, they're concerned about their customers' health and well-being, even above their, their, their own business interests, and that they were going to get to the bottom of this question as to whether smoking really does cause disease and death. And so they created the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which was later uh, renamed the Council for Tobacco Research, and the, um, the purpose for this committee, which of course was staffed by uh, the tobacco industry itself, was to make objective research grants to prove or disprove the theory that cigarettes cause cancer or other diseases. Um, in reality, what, the, what Turk ended up being was a public relations mouthpiece, and you can even find tobacco industry internal documents in which they privately admit that. They used these grants for studies as a stalling technique to try to maintain what they called the open controversy, the open question. They tried to prolong the day of reckoning where it would be recognized that smoking causes disease and death. And the types of studies that they actually funded um, were not geared towards answering that question. They mainly focused on um, much broader uh, Questions like what is the mechanism that causes cancer, um, and and you know cancer has not been cured yet, and the tobacco industry knew that if you focus on something that is so uh, macro, it pulls away the attention, uh, the viewer's attention from the fact that cigarettes are causing cancer, and so. What they, what they were funding were really just studies that they knew were not going to yield any results that would harm their business. Another thing the tobacco industry did um, was to form a project called Project White Coat in which they convinced um, doctors and, and scientists to testify on their behalf in tobacco litigation to say um, that it's not, it's not a settled question as to whether cancer causes diseases. And so they paid these, these, these witnesses handsomely to basically um, <coughs> violate their, their, their professional principles and duties um, to say that the tobacco industry was not liable for the injuries it products caused. The casino industry is doing the same kind of thing in terms of corrupting scholarship and science. Um, and they do it in, in a number of ways. Again, funneling money to scientists who are friendly to them and thus beholden to them. And employing front groups um, as a way of laundering the money, like um, the uh, National Cancer for Responsible Gaming, which is funded by the American Gaming Association, which is the, uh, which is, uh, the analog to the Tobacco Institute, both trade, is trade organizations. Um, whose, sole, whose sole mission is to protect the interests of the industry. 
Um, so you have the, the uh, NCRG making grants just like Turk did, and you can imagine that the, the kind of grants that they're making are definitely not intended to actually uh, pin down responsibility for the suffering and the harm that those products cause to those who are purveying it. They've even gone so far as to establishing their own scientific journals, publishing outfits, conferences, and research centers. So the types of studies that the gambling industry funds are very similar to the ones that the tobacco industry uh, funded. Um, they, they do two things. They take the broad view of just looking at the neurological causes of addiction. What causes addiction? You know, what causes cancer and what causes addiction? It's a very broad area and it doesn't bring home any responsibility to the gambling industry. They don't, what their studies don't do is they don't focus on the fact that this is an addiction that can be triggered by their machines. And that the, that the as, as we would say in law, the, the probable cause of the injury that these people are suffering is linked to their use of video slots and video poker. These studies also don't take a look at the strategies that casinos use to create an environment that is conducive to people spending hours and hours of their day in the casino. And they don't look at the other business practices that the casino uses, which are venal and purely profit-driven. And also, they don't look at the well-being of the gamblers themselves as people who are being preyed upon. I've been doing a lot of research lately about the gambling industry, and I've been dismayed to find that every time I pull an article, the first thing I have to do is I have to look to see how much money the author has taken from the gambling industry thus far. What connections does that person have to the gambling industry? And almost invariably, there is some connection. Either they got a grant directly from the gambling industry, or they've been uh, a private consultant to the gambling industry, and it's, it's, it's truly dazzling how much more successful the gambling industry has been than the tobacco industry in shaping the direction and um, scope of scientific uh, uh, research on the problem of, of gambling addiction. So again, the way you, um, you divert from causation is to either go big or go very small. So in the tobacco industry's case, it's looking at the mechanism that causes cancer, any cancer. Or you look to see if there's some constitutional or genetic weakness in smokers themselves that causes them particularly to develop cancer or any other smoking-related diseases. And the gambling industry is also funding that kind of uh, research where they're trying to uh, make it seem like it's just an unfortunate few people who become pathological or problem gamblers, that there's something wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with the activity of gambling. In other words, blame the customer, not the product. Another thing that's very strange and practiced even more by the gambling uh, industry than the tobacco industry is that scholars who are receiving funding for these studies almost always bring up the countervailing benefits of gambling. So they say, well, you know, gambling's great for uh, the elderly. It gets them out of the house. It gives them something to do. It makes them be more social. They, you know, and in fact, when you go into a casino, it's an el if an elderly person is there, it's the elderly person in the machine for hours and hours. And they probably haven't eaten they probably haven't taken their meds on time. They might even have soiled themselves because they're so in the zone that they forget all of their, their self-care regimens and um, just they're just there uh, to satisfy an itch that can never be scratched. Another really important and effective way that the gambling industry and the tobacco industry have persuaded society to think a certain way about their business practices and their products is creating a special vocabulary to encourage people to use certain benign words rather than the kinds of words that would highlight their 
um, their, their, their role as a disease vector. So for instance, the tobacco industry loves euphemisms. They don't talk, it doesn't talk about um, toxic ingredients in its cigarettes. It will call them biologically active or controversial compounds. Um, the, the, the freebasing effect that a hit of nicotine from a cigarette causes your brain, the tobacco industry refers to that as impact and satisfaction, all positive, good things. And you'll never see the tobacco industry talk about addiction. They'll talk about habituation. Likewise, the gambling industry loves euphemisms. Uh, they, don't, they don't call it gambling. It's called gaming. And uh, that makes it sound very childlike and fun and, you know, something, something completely benign. It's, it's considered entertainment or fun. And um, the gambling industry doesn't refer to um, problem gambling or gambling addiction. They say things like those people uh, are unable to gamble responsibly. Uh, they call it non-responsible gambling. Gaming, I mean. <laughs> So what is the reason for, for creating a new way of, of, of uh, framing the issues and, and employing a dialogue that is benign? Um, in 2001, a senior vice president of Philip Morris uh, uh, summarized it nicely. He said, at the end of the day, we want to be seen as a normal corporation, one with legal, regulatory, and public opinion challenges to be sure, but with challenges that are manageable and do not threaten the legitimacy of the company. So it's, it's more than CYA. It's we want, to have, we want a place at the table. We want to be seen as a normal corporation, just like you know, people who manufacture macaroni and cheese and cereals, which is obviously their alter ego. Um, and uh, you know, they, they, want, they want to be seen as um, uh, productive and positive members of society, not, not the destroyer of health. And life, and even in the early, in the uh, mid '90s, the tobacco industry could see where where their their role as the pariah of society was really damaging them. This started happening when the uh, there were some whistleblowers and some internal documents that started linking out, and um, congressional hearings were being held. And one uh, senior vice president for Philip Morris warned that. Our products will become relegated to the same position in society as condoms and pornography sold in plain wrappers from under the cover, uh, under the counter. And this actually is true. In Australia, for instance, they now do have plain packaging. And more and more places are, are pulling down their power walls of cigarettes, uh, the big displays where it's a whole wall. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, recently, CVS, the large pharmacy chain, decided to stop selling cigarettes altogether. So gambling wants you to forget its unsavory side as well. It doesn't want you to remember that it's associated with crime and public health disasters and social devastation. Uh, but the fact remains that when a casino moves into a community, so does crime, poverty, and economic for not only that community, but nearby communities and their residents. Um, oftentimes, local businesses suffer when, a, when a, uh, a casino that has restaurants and stores and everything else um, self-contained, um, people will go there instead of a local business. Um, and the, the human suffering that is caused and the economic suffering that's caused as a result of, um, for instance, a casino pulling dollars away from lottery tickets, which um, fund local community uh, needs. Um, if you weigh it all out, the economic benefits and the economic um, uh, disaster that those kinds of results can cause, um, it, it clearly outweighs any benefit of having legalized gambling in a casino in your community. Finally, I want to talk about personal responsibility rhetoric. Both industries do it. They use it to, as I said before, shift focus away from their role as a disease vector, to stave off regulation and litigation, 
and to create doubt about the danger and the negative consequences that their products cause. I should also say that using personal responsibility rhetoric is, is particularly effective in America because we have this rugged individualism sort of inborn culturally and we, we tend to feel that our own self-determination and uh, free will and free choice our, 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 our uh, national birthright. The tobacco industry, uh, particularly when it's, it's being sued uh, by a smoker who has been injured or by their estate or a relative who has died, they use personal responsibility rhetoric to shift the focus to the victim. They talk about freedom of choice, but what they really mean is you chose to smoke and it's your fault if you got sick and you need to suffer the consequences. So um, again, this type, of, uh, this type of rhetoric is using a euphemism. It's saying freedom of choice, but what it's really saying is you're to blame. And this, of course, um, minimizes the role of the, the manufacturer of these highly engineered, highly addictive products, and also ignores the deceptive and relentless marketing that the tobacco industry, uh, tobacco industry uses to attract and keep its customers. The casino industry definitely follows the tobacco industry's example, but has also improved upon it. The American Gaming Association's former president, Frank Ferenkopf, said in an interview uh, recently that he took inspiration from the tobacco industry's trade group, the Tobacco Institute, in running his own trade group, the American uh, Gaming Association. And uh, what Ferenkopf uh, refers to, um, when he refers to pathological gambling, he says it's the inability to gamble responsibly. And says, and you know, again, that negates the industry's targeting of, of uh, at risk and problem gamblers. And puts all the onus on the, the, the customer and says that their injuries are, are entirely self-inflicted. The important question here is how can customers gamble responsibly when the machines are designed to, pre to prevent them from doing so? Slot machines are designed to be addictive, to help you um, play very fast, where you bypass your, your decision-making capacity and to, uh, to move you into a zone or trance where you are losing track of time and every other responsibility or um, obligation in your life. And this kind, of, uh, this kind of zone or trance is meant to override your moral agency and your freedom of choice. Players are, uh, again, encouraged to stay as long as possible. Time on device is the most important thing to the casinos. They don't care if you don't lose your money fast, as long as you lose all your money, and that they refer to that as playing to extinction. Not only do the machines encourage this kind of behavior, but sometimes casinos even use human beings to, uh, to supplement this kind of uh, encouragement. Uh, they use what are called uh, luck ambassadors, who are people who are watching customers on closed circuit televisions with security cameras, and they're looking for people who are starting to look despondent because they've lost enough and they, and they want to maybe leave. And then they rush over to them and they say, you look like you're having a tough day. Here, why don't you have a free meal? Here's a voucher. Go get yourself a meal. Or here, here's a voucher. Why don't you have some drinks? And relax, and then come back to your machine and have you know have <coughs> more fun. Um, to me, that is the most vile and venal example of the casino's intention to trap and keep captive problem and addicted gamblers. So the points that I hope you'll take away from this presentation are that both the tobacco industry and the gambling industry purposely uh, create their products to be addictive. And they use various business tactics to preserve their customer base and to maintain profits, including the corruption of science and scholarship and the creation of, um, 
a new vocabulary to refer to their industries, products, to um, shape public opinion and frame the issues in ways that are favorable to them. And finally, the use of personal responsibility rhetoric to shift blame away from the industry and onto consumers. Thank you very much.